few participants and, and, the, and colleagues uh, to see if there are any areas of, 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 of work that are relevant from what Dr. Abdul Karim has presented or from what I'm going to present uh, to keep in touch. And uh, we, are, we are definitely interested in building coalitions, in building new friendships. So for us, it would be a, a, a good opportunity and a pleasure to, uh, to use this opportunity, this webinar, as, a, as the beginning of a, of a conversation, as the beginning of a dialogue with, a, with new partners a, within Uganda and beyond. So the subject matter of today, it's the role of international water law in fostering cooperation and environmental uh, protection. I think it's a difficult topic, if you allow me to say so, because everything that has to do with rules and with norms, uh, traditionally, it's a little bit dry. So the good news is that we have today with us also two colleagues, one from the government of Uganda, uh, Mr. Jamil Kijinji, and also a colleague from the civil society, in this case from uh, the, the cross-border uh, part of, of the, uh, the COCTECO uh, wetland in Kenya, uh, Ms. Jacqueline Mototo. So they are going to give us also a very practical uh, view of how some of these concepts figure out and work out in reality and, uh, and they are implemented in, in real life. So if you allow me, let me just start uh, uh, quickly. This is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna go through, we're gonna go through a, a journey that takes us from international environmental law to international water law and ecosystems. Then some specific considerations attaining transboundary wetlands. Then we're gonna zoom in into what the NBA, NBI Wetlands Cooperation Program has done. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. A, one small commercial here, part of the work that we're presenting on the NBI was led actually by Dr. Abdul Karim Said when he was a, a director general of that organization. So it, a, we have that also great opportunity of having firsthand a, a knowledge of a, how this, program was actually implemented in real life. Let me start with some very key basic uh, notions of international environmental law. Um, as you all know, law is the, refers to those roles, uh, rules and principles that guide human interaction. Now, if you would ask me as a lawyer if it's necessary, I would say, of course, because it's what regulates those behaviors uh, that are critical for uh, for for human interaction and in the context of environment they are critical to prevent environmental harm to promote mechanisms for sustainable development and for uh, achieving those um, those sustainable development goals and other targets that we as a society have put upon ourselves now, obviously, it's not perfect, and we have to recognize that up front. There's a lot of criticism that can be made for and towards law. It's not going to solve all environmental problems. It's not a silver bullet. Sometimes it doesn't go hand in hand with science, and that's one of the main challenges that we have. Law always is a little bit behind science and reality. Um, and then there's that complex dynamic relationship that uh, we see from a changing, very quickly changing environment, climate change, uh, environmental change, societal change, development requirements, and uh, the, the fact that law is too rigid and doesn't allow us to cope fully with those complexities. So it has a lot of positive things, but still there's a lot of, a, there's a lot of, of, of a, um, still issues that have to be complemented from different, uh, different uh, angles. Now, this specific session, we're gonna be dealing with principles, uh, norms, agreements, and institu institutions 
of environmental, international environmental law for the protection, specifically for the protection of nature, which by the way, also, if you allow me the small commercial, this is on what I actually did my PhD in the University of Dundee in Scotland. So let's have a look first at the international law and the environment. I think it's important to leave up front that this has to do with activities that have an impact directly on environment, on that on the landscape. And it includes issues as complicated as pollution, deforestation, climate change, and many others. The objective, as we said before, is to promote sustainable development and to ensure that there is a, a natural environment that protected for future generations. What is it made out of? It's made out of treaties, conventions, agreements, and the, all of them designed to, precisely, to promote a sustainability. And these agreements are made by whom? They are made by governments and international organizations, and they are implemented through a variety of, a, through a variety of, of, of mechanisms. As any other discipline, International environmental law has evolved throughout the throughout the time. In the in the beginnings, they were focused on protecting specific specific uh, specific landscapes and specific species and habitats. In the 70s, or in the second phase that goes approximately from 70s to beginning of the 90s, we were trying to find a common balance and a and a and a uh, a balance between economic development and environmental protection. That's where this idea of sustainability started to, to develop. And 1992 with the Rio Conventions marks a milestone in what is a today's um, international environmental law. That's when many of those of the of the big conventions that they, that that um, shape and rule our 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 behavior, like the Convention on Biodiversity, Biological Diversity, or the Convention of Climate Change, they were actually signed in. So I just wanted to 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 pose you a, a small question. You know that in this in this series of webinars, it's complicated to have a a, a dialogue. But I would be very happy to to hear from you if you could just give me a, a feel of how many how many a, um, international agreements do you think we have I will be checking on the on the chat and the, yeah and I'm very curious to hear to hear your your responses um as you think on how many how many international agreements do we have let me go into the second part of the presentation which now focuses in on fresh water on fresh water ecosystems and a international international water law. So um, I wanted to take this as a as an example. Uh, imagine that this is uh, this is one of those papyrus wetlands, uh, maybe between Entebbe and and Kampala, and you can see that there's a series of a uh, different international environmental law instruments that are applicable to the same landscape. You have the Convention on Biological Diversity that establishes or supports the establishment of protected areas, but of course also protects species. You have the Ramsar Convention that looks specifically at wetlands. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. We have the UNFCCC, the UNF U United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that regulates all, all things related to um, adaptation measures implemented on that same landscape. And of course, we have the, the rivers causing, crossing through. So you also have a conventions on water courses and the, the so-called UNEC Water Convention. This is just to, to illustrate that the one specific landscape or one specific wetland, uh, it's ruled by a multiplicity of, uh, of, of treaties which have different focus and they we're going to be focusing specifically on that one of wetlands and that one of uh, water. 
Water is a complicated thing that has been regulated differently um, if you compare it with biodiversity or you compare it with the, uh, with the development of climate change. Water has actually two conventions. That's going to be hopefully a topic for a different uh, for a different webinar is something that also uh, the Water Resources Institute has built a lot of capacities on. It's a it's a it's a it's a, a trending topic, and I think uh, I'll try just to give a very brief overview of those two instruments that exist uh, currently for uh, for managing and, and governing international water courses. One is specifically from the UN. It was created or drafted before 1997. It's called the 1997 UN Water Courses Convention and promotes sustainable and equitable use of water resources. Um, it also compiles all the, the, the principles related to uh, related to this to this uh, to this field the un water courses the unec water courses convention differently from the un water courses convention you no know it's a little bit confusing comes from the uh, united nations economic commission for europe but at some point the european countries explore the possibility of opening it for ratification of a uh, of countries beyond europe i'm going to show you in a map just in a second, how this has played along. But I want to focus maybe more on issues of water allocation and management. I think that the, if you take the UN Water Courses Convention, the cardinal principles of, princi of equitable and reasonable utilization and the obligation not to cause significant harms to other states are what uh, really uh, this, this instrument is all about. Whereas you could argue that the UNEC Water Convention promotes more of integrated water resources management approach together with an ecosystems approach. And I think both instruments, as it has been said many times in this forum and in others, they are complementary to each other. Now here you can see a, in the map, specifically if we zoom in into, into Africa, that there are already several countries that are parties to the Water Courses Convention. Um, but more significantly, in recent times, more and more African countries are uh, becoming parties also to the UNEC Water Convention, the so-called 1992 Water Convention. That's the one that you see in that um, um, light green i believe senegal is not in this in this map might be a little bit outdated but the important thing is that uh, more and more uh, countries are becoming part of this global family for sharing for 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 having a common framework for discussing issues of transboundary water cooperation and environmental protection uh, if you allow me to say so, also government of Uganda, as far as I know, it's also uh, has been uh, uh, attending some of these meetings for a long time. And uh, who knows, maybe in the future we also will see uh, Uganda uh, being part of this, uh, uh, of this map here uh, from the UNEC Water Convention. In terms of rules, I don't want to I don't want to bore you too much with the purely legalistic issues, but I think it's important for us if this is a a, a presentation on on rules that govern uh, international uh, water bodies to know what are the substantive rules that govern those bodies. The first one is the obligation not to, to cause significant harm. It's close to that very basic principle of law that you should not cause harm to your neighbor. So that translated into the environment, everything that might be of significant impact to the country uh, downstream or even upstream, it might be considered a, a transgression of that obligation not to cause significant harm. Uh, we, of course, are uh, governed by rules of sustainable development, precautionary principles. So in, in, in absence of full, a scientific understanding of what would be the consequences of a planned activity, 
Um, then the principle of precaution tells us stop, not go further. We shouldn't uh, go with, uh, with, with those projects. Of course, we have issues of intergenerational equity, polluter pays uh, principle. And the one that is very interesting for me, which is the ecosystems approach, as per which uh, states that are parties to, this, uh, to these instruments, they have the obligation to protect and to preserve ecosystems, whether transboundary or, uh, or, or national. Likewise, you have the substantive rules, which are the guiding principles by which countries should uh, abide themselves. We also have a series of procedural rules which help to implement those substantive rules. For example, the duty to notify if a country is going to carry out a project that might have significant impacts on downstream or on the on that neighborhood of countries sharing resources, you have a, noti a, a duty to notify that uh, those countries that might be affected, that the project is ongoing. You also have more uh, effective ways of cooperating, which include exchange of information, uh, also also the obligation to carry out transboundary environmental impact assessments, which is also, by the way, uh, a, a normative requirement to all projects in almost all legislations of the world. So you can also see that there's a, a very clear relationship between um, international law and a, its, a, its implementation at the national level. Coming more specifically into wetlands, we have what, the, what it's called the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Signed in in 1971, already in 1971, countries had agreed that wetlands, because of their uh, very particular characteristics, they deserved special consideration and specific uh, and specific uh, specific support. Um, the scope of the of the of the of the Ramsar Convention is all wetlands and its conservation and uh, what they refer to as uh, as wise use that's the, that's their their conceptualization of sustainable development they denominated wise use of wetlands and according to it of course uganda is a, is is a member of the ramsar convention and according to uh -huh. it uh, there's the state's obligations to designate wetlands uh, that might be of critical importance and international importance to the world, uh, but also for the uh, national land use planning and to establish natural reserves for protection of those of those wetlands. Um, maybe if the if the host can help me, I think one mic might be open. So if you can mute the that mic that's open, that might be very helpful. Um, yeah. Sorry for that. Let me just, I wanted to share with you uh, this idea of how all of these instruments, they interact between each other. You have at the global level conventions like the ones we were talking about, Ramsar Convention, UN Water Courses Convention, UNEC Convention in the case that Uganda decides to accede to it. But then you have at the regional level, you have also different instruments that might incorporate some of those principles from the global level. You have the corporate framework agreement that it's also a story in its own and that we can have a specific webinar on that one, but it really compiles some of the best practices and rules and norms given by the global level. But you also have instruments like the Nile Basin Initiative, which already puts in motion some of these principles as we're gonna see later. At the cross border. Now, this is where it gets interesting. If you go to Sangobe Mincero Forest, or you go to the to the work that my colleagues are doing in CEO uh, Malaba Malakisi, then you would see how bilateral agreements they incorporate the global and the regional level and they put it into action. And that's what we're going to be talking later on. And of course, that gets implemented also by national uh, regulations. Uh, in the case of Uganda. The National Environmental Act through 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 NEMA and also natural and environmental regulations. So let me go into a specific considerations for transboundary wetlands. Um, I think I'm taking a little bit 
uh, over over my time so i'll try to 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 be brief i wanted to ask also a uh, to the participants, specifically the ones that are from Uganda, if you recognize where this specific wetland that you see in the picture is, I would be I would be really happy to to hear if some of the if some of the participants recognize uh, that landscape that it's in the that it's in the picture. But I think more than that, moreover, more important than the picture, I think what is interesting here is to understand that wetlands provide a huge range of ecosystem services that go from a water purification to carbon sequestration. They provide habitats for, for waterfall and, and wildlife. They provide also economic opportunities through a provisioning services. So they provide fish, timber, medicinal plants, et cetera, et cetera. So wetlands are really a critical ecosystem and that's also the reason why they deserve, in my opinion and the opinion of, of some others, eh, they really deserve a specific eh, regulation because they provide, as we were saying, a whole range of eh, ecosystem services that are of critical importance for, eh, for, for livelihoods of, eh, of our populations. Now, the important thing is that if we conserve, if we use those wetlands in a sustainable way, we can profit economically from those wetlands and at the same time conserve some of those key functions that they provide to humans, but also to nature. I think that the, in that regard, if you allow me another commercial, I'm Costa Rican, and the, one of the of the things that Costa Rica does very well is this idea of a, a ecological tourism. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, government of Costa Rica and government of Uganda are working very very close to learn from each other how they 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 can continue providing this idea of tourism and recreation from an ecological point of view for benefit of of the uh, of the of the economy just a small um, commercial in that sense this map i'm sure that probably you have seen many times it's the map of transboundary transboundary waters you can see why that topic is very relevant in 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 regions like mine but also uh, here in uganda you can see that the whole territory of uganda is within um, within uh, that transboundary waters concept. I think uh, the colleagues of WRI might uh, might uh, uh, correct me, but I think it's 98% comma something of the territory that it's under transboundary uh, transboundary waters concept. Now, if you see also issues of transboundary wetlands, you can also see here that Uganda has some of the transboundary wetlands. Those are those purple spots in the map that are of international relevance. So now you can see why I'm focusing on issues of UN Water Courses Convention and UNEC Water Convention, but also how that actually plays a role together with, uh, with uh, Ramsar and Ramsar protection. I think we have said uh, quite a bit about the Ramsar Convention, so I'm not gonna go again into those uh, into those uh, details, uh, um, but more important, I wanted to go into the idea of establishment of transboundary Ramsar sites, which is what we're going to be hearing from our colleagues in the second part of the uh, of the webinar. I think quite interestingly, we are still trying to set up the very first transboundary Ramsar site in East Africa. I think uh, my colleague uh, Jamil can speak about it. They are not. They are complicated and not complicated at the same time because it means bringing two jurisdictions together that have uh, independently decide to uh, to protect a cross border landscape and announce that to the international community that they want to go further and have different uh, management instruments to uh, manage that. Uh, that habitat or that uh, that specific landscape jointly, and that's a little bit the story of the work that the, our colleagues are going to be presenting afterwards. 
Final sets of slides, I think it zooms in, as I was saying from the global level, now we zoom in into the, into the basin and from the basin, we're gonna zoom in specifically into cross-border territories. We were saying that Uganda, Uganda's territory is in a huge majority um, in, a, in, in a shared basin. It says actually here the figure 99.5. So I was mistaken maybe by 1%. The idea is that really the topic is of critical importance for Uganda moving forward. Uh, that's also the reason why Uganda, or one of the reasons why Uganda is the seat to the Nile Basin Initiative, which as many of you know, encompasses uh, 10 member states, all the member states from the, from the basin, of course. And its vision is to have a, and to achieve sustainable socioeconomic development through the equitable utilization of and benefit from the common Nile Basin water resources. Now, as we move forward, we see that more and more and more, the discussion moves away just from water and development of water resources and hydropower and the irrigation schemes and brings more and more the, uh, the idea of the environment and environmental protection and even environmental sustainable use because uh, uh, yeah, we, we have learned from the 90s, 30 years later, that uh, that uh, we need to focus both on development, but also on uh, um, ensuring that the ecosystem services functions continue to be provided. This is just a very very interesting slide I borrowed from Dr. Abdul Karim, uh, that it actually shows how you take those principles of international law, which might be a little bit dry. And you apply them to a program of a, of action like the one that NBI was pushing forward, and in this specific domain is where a, we actually did some of the work that is going to be presented a, by my by my colleagues. The work was done in three landscapes. They will speak a, at length to them, but we're going to be focusing today in two specific experiences: the one between Sango Bay and Minsiro Forest. Uh, shared between Uganda and Tanzania, of course, and then that one of the COCTECO uh, COC um, wetland, which is part of that uh, complex of the CO Malaba Malakisi uh, system shared between Uganda and uh, Uganda and uh, and Kenya. We had a specific methodology which included monographs, then development of a transboundary management plans that then led to the development of a investment plans for their implementation. And we started, a, we kicked out some of the work with implementations of measures. So I think a, that's where I'm going to leave it to. And, um, uh, and with that, I would like to really, really thank you for for listening to this brief presentation, well, not so brief. I hope that it was uh, that it was of interest. And uh, if Dr. Abdul Karim is not there, then I would assume that I'm gonna take also the yeah. um, the chairing of the of the webinar until the end. Yeah, uh, Juan Carlos, I'm still around, but as I said earlier. I need to leave now. Uh, thank you very much okay. for very informative. Uh, you went out of the time, but that's really very informative in, uh, information in your slides. Thank you. So I, I hand over to you. Yeah. Thank All right. You very, very, very good. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Karim. Thank you. Colleagues uh, and participants, is there any burning question that you would like or comment that you would like to 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 do? Um, I'm seeing here in the in the chat. But I, I, I wonder if anyone would like to come in with a, with a comment or a question. Otherwise, if, uh, if, I don't, if I don't see anything right now, maybe I would like to give the floor uh, to Jamil. Jamil, are you there? Yeah. Okay, yes, Jamil, uh... do you want to? You're in the car. 
Should yeah, we, we should we go it. first with should we go first with Jackie and let let Jackie go or you want to go first? I want to go first because you saw him on the road. <laughs> okay, that's a, yeah. that's very good. Let's let's go with a, let's go with you. Let me stop sharing here, and oh. um, I'm gonna put up your slides. Yes. Maybe in the meantime, you want to start presenting yourself. Oh, mm. yeah. I'm um, by the name is Jamil Chinji. Natural Resources Officer Chotera, Uganda. And I've been around in this region for close now, coming 20 years, doing service. And for the area in interest on the transparent aspect, we have already implemented activities under the support of GIZ, NBI, Wetland International, in that line, we link up with the, my Tanzanian counterpart. That's all I can give on intro introduction. Then maybe very I'll good. Come. So now your presentation yeah. is on. Uh, yeah. Jamil, the floor, the floor is yours. Let's go. Let's aim for for twenty minutes yeah. so that we can leave a space yeah. of a uh, ten ten for maybe questions and answers. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Carlos. Generally, I'm going to give an overview of what has been going on in the area, and through the transboundary project that was been supported by. NBI, GIZ, and the others, like you have seen the part five, which was agreed after development, the monograph and the management plan uh, in commensuration of the conservation investment plan that was made jointly with USAID. It was agreed that we start seeing something being on the ground. And as you look at that slide, the process was rigorous, and we used to engage the locals in doing this themselves. And the presentation has these following outlines, and we are going to start with this. It was, Carlos, you are moving very fast. Introduction of the project, plan development, status of the wetland in landscape issues, threats, management, planning framework, and implementation strategy. Next. Next, Carlos. Then the project's inception was intending to support transboundary water cooperation in the Nile Basin. And basically, we, particularly we are looking at the Sangobe means zero catchment, but the project targeted three catchments, the Semliki and Sesioteko. The Sesioteko is Uganda, Kenya, Semliki is DRST and Uganda. And for this particular project that I'm presenting was targeting the Sangobe means zero ecosystem, that is Tanzania, Uganda. And the Ugandan side falls in Chotara district, and the Tanzanian side in Misheng. The photo you are seeing is a joint Ugandan team involving ministry, local governments, and community representative in seeing the project off with the Tanzanian outputs, the counterparts. That was in Misheng district. Then some of you can see themselves there if you are keen with that. Next. Mm. Uh, the, the landscape is quite huge. It harbors one of the biggest Ramza site, and the acreage is 1,700 for 46 kilometers squared, with the biggest one of the biggest Ramza site on the Ugandan side. That is a Samuka Ramza site, which is Sangobe, Musamba Island, Kagera system Ramza site. It was gazetted in two. The voice. Jamil, can you hear me? Jamil. Mm -hmm. Um, colleagues, maybe Jackie, can you can you give me a um can you tell me if you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm able to hear you. Okay, Jamil is back. Jamil, can you continue?
Your mic is off, Jamil. Um, yes. Sorry, okay, I'm using the phone. Ahead. I'm using mobile data and somebody was calling. And I was saying that being the communities that in their social being, they have no boundaries in this. And we have seen the resource, the Kagera traverses the entire system. The animals, we had human wildlife conflict and we couldn't manage the resource separately. We had agreed to work on a mutual arrangement, but the project now brought the policy approach and we had several meetings and currently we're moving on. Proceed, Carlos. Currently, geographical location is that uh, the status of the landscape, the changing course of the Kagera River, you can see it, the meanders, the S, the C, the N, the M, these are a result of siltation and the changing patterns of the flows of in the tides and the system keeps on changing because of the sediment load, you can see. And those are the targets that we want to see that we reduce the amount of silt. In fact, when you look uh, above, you will see the Kagera waters brown and the lake waters uh, clear. So sometimes people communicate that the water doesn't mix, but this is a simple science, uh, an evidence of erosion happening. Can proceed, Carlos, because the time is not on our side. There is a, there are issues of resource use conflict. There are forest reserves within them. There are wildlife and there are communities sitting with, within the system. And we we had to join hands because the Mizero side reserve crosses into the Ugandan side to form the Kaiso, Maravigambo, Tero, and Namarara. And then the Tanzanian side is the Mizero Forest Reserve. And the project is targeting to have a unified Ramza site because now we have key species like the Shubil. Now we have the golden cat, it has been seen there, and many threatened species are being seen. The forest elephant, we still have them, and we feel that these need to be protected. Continue, Carlos. Mm, the topography is that. I think Carlos will share the slides. The hydrology, the basically the entire area is composed of both the rugged terrain, which are cliffs of rocks, and then the, uh, the grasslands and the permanent wetlands. So the area has a lot of richness in both wetlands, resources, and other water-related uh, ecosystems and needs protection. Continue. These are the key aspects that the Sangobe Mizero system play as a landscape. So water storage, it, it helps in slowing movement of, of water and releasing, but also maintaining its quality as it regulates it. Continue. Continue, Carlos. Yes, there is this evidence. The photo before this, Carlos. The slide before this. You, you can able to see the changes that have happened at the Kagera gauges. Now some of the gauges are even out. They are not gauging water. So it means that there is a lot of changes that have occurred in a, on a negative side, and we need to protect the resource. Otherwise, doom is expected. Continue. In that photo, the vehicle we are seeing mixed with the animals is Carlos's vehicle. Carlos was coming to inspect project site, and we told him that the area during this season is flooded and stayed here as a powerful machine. But we didn't move five meters from where you are seeing us. But also the animals you can see, you are trying to shift them to a, a higher ground through the system. That is a road that is used usually, but people were using now boats and the vehicles couldn't proceed further. So the system has a lot of issues related to climate change and needs to be looked at. Proceed, Carlos. I think this one I have explained. In the others, you can proceed. This one also, we have touched a bit on this. Uh, the, the area has been cited to, high, to have high potentials of peat in the area. And Uganda started studies on seeing how they can handle the peat, the peat areas. And Sangobe hosts 
the biggest uh, output in the research so far done. And we think that this is an output that also uh, gives us a clue on, on what we need to do to protect the resource to reduce the carbon emissions. Continue. Continue. These are the changes. You can see the photos of the Kagera mouth. Uh, in 1987, the photo can show you how the coast was. And the photo next can give you the year is what? February, what? Can't, can't see here. The zoom screen is covering there. But you can see 1987 and 2008. There is a lot of great changes towards the lake side. So it means there is a lot of siltation going on. Proceed, Carlos. Carlos, proceed. The status of the landscape in terms of flora and fauna, we, can, we have seen, is it, it is a high, a high bad area. It, it is an IBA, it is an important bad area. But also you can see the golden cut. It was sited in a Miziro, Sangobe Miziro forest, and needs protected. The reptiles you are seeing and the high potential in the fish domain. We have a lot of fish species in the area. But the papyrus is a predominant species in the permanent wetland areas in this area. Uh -huh. Proceed. Livelihood. People in the Chotera and the Miziro site. Are dependent on this on this ecosystem for their uh, li livelihood in terms of uh, agriculture. They, when they don't do crop, they do livestock. When they don't do livestock, they are doing plantation forestry, but also they do some others like hunting and other related activities that are tied to this presence of this ecosystem. Once it is gone, a livelihood also is seen to be affected and poverty, it's up the community. Proceed. Yes? The landscape, uh, land use and land cover, those are the percentages we can see as per the landscape. I think I will give you the slide and you share with the people on this platform and we see. Proceed, Carlos. And the area, the ecosystem has these services and I think all of you know they are, they are provisioning, regulating and supporting, but also the cultural aspect. Sango Bay is a key cultural site when you look at the Zero Tanzania site and the Ugandan site. They, there is a lot of link on history and culture in this area, and this needs to be protected. It is a lifeline for many uh, uh, wildlife, but also the human. Uh, uh, activities that are there and even they are being there. Proceed. Ecosystem services are in plenty. These are pulled out of the uh, conservation investment plan that was done. And they clearly show that a lot is there and the potential is in valuation of this ecosystem was done under the uh, CIP. And these are the values then that we are attached. And we think by now the figures may be higher than that. But as you know before, any activity you compare for the trade-off that as I, I'm doing with this, this is the cost I'm losing. So when you compare with that, you may support conservation or degradation in that line. Proceed, Carlos. Mm. We did stakeholder analysis and the category of stakeholders we have there following those category and category A, A which is highly critical to their political leaders, private sector, faith based organization, and media. Then B, we have the national, national government departments and the others. Then C, we, have, we mainly look at the tourists, transporters, herbalists, researchers, and other institutions. Then the civil societies following the other hand. And the, each of these segments play an important role according to level of influence. Continue. The policies. There are a lot of policies in relation to conserving the Sangobe Museum 
a system, but many of these policies are non-transboundary. They are territorial and country specific in nature, and they require review and harmonization to create a transboundary management approach to deal with the challenges at play. And it is due to this that the project came in place to instill some of these structures to work with the communities and see that we protect these resources. Proceed, Carlos. Carlos, proceed. And this is the, the this is how business was planned to flow. That at the helm we shall see the international community, which is the globe. We have the regional, which is having all these bodies. We have the national, and these we think if they work together, we shall see positives, and then the local. Proceed, Carlos. Carlos, you can proceed. Issues and threats facing the Sangobe Mizero ecosystem. We have the drivers for these problems. We have the pressures, state and impact state impact and responses. And the framework used under this is, is to synthesize and visualize causes, effect, interaction of the wetland landscape and develop potential actions for improving and implementation, this implementing implementation of sustainable wetland conservation management activities in the Sangobe Mezero landscape. Proceed, Carlos. You can proceed. These are the things I've been explaining. Proceed, proceed proceed and this is our vision in that project a sustainable a sustainably managed sangobe means zero transboundary wetland providing equitable opportunities and benefits of positive can continue that is the vision we are working the objective are to promote conservation of the sangobe means zero ecosystem and its catchment to promote and support sustainable sources of livelihood for the communities on that are dependent on the Sangobe means zero transboundary wetlands to support and establish these systems. Continue, continue. Continue, Carlos. We're working against time. These are the structural issues we think that they will change. These I've talked about these documents and proceed, Carlos. I want to look at the the other projects that we did. Proceed. Proceed, Carlos. Proceed. Now, within the Green Borders project that was supported jointly in this phase, we are targeting the resource users themselves to see that we have changed and we also rehabilitate the area. Proceed, Carlos. This is a photo for one of the communities that we interacted. And they, this is the sequence of how business is expected to flow until the outcomes are brought. Proceed. Carlos, you can proceed. Under the early investment project, which is the Green Borders Projects in 2020, it was about 80 million. And these are the targets to start up a district tree nursery, raising bamboo and other assorted native tree species for mainly wetland boundary demarcation and livelihood improvement in communities of Chotera. This has been completed, this was completed and was supported also with support from NFA. This was done and the resources were even shared with other catchments. But these are the challenges we had because it was COVID time, a delay was done. And under wetland demarcation using bamboo uh, at Mizero village, around close to 14 kilometers, we used bamboo and we were demarcating the extent to which communities cannot exceed, like zoning, not looking at the standard boundary demarcation, because for the communities, they want to know if I'm to use, where should I stop? This is the evidence of the trees raised in the nursery and the bamboos when they have been planted. The project- Jamil, five minutes, point. yes? Can we conclude yes. in five yes, minutes? Yes, proceed, 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 proceed. Proceed, Carlos, with the slides. Yeah, you can see that's the nursery inspection. Those are the outputs. Planting was done. Those are the evidences. Proceed, Carlos. Carlos, proceed to the slide. 
the early investment scheme, strength, strengthening transboundary governance and management in Sangobe. We can proceed. These ones people will read as you share the slides. Mm -hmm. Under these projects, these were tar uh, targets. These are, I've talked about this. Proceed, Carlos. Carlos, proceed. Proceed. I thank you because the time was against us, but the uh, nursery activities and the tree planting still continue even when the project funding across the other phase and we are still producing these native tree species and they are there and currently we are preparing Bodo close to around we are targeting 70,000 seedlings and they are already out we are breaking we have so far ported close to 10,000 and we think by the end of this month all the 70,000 will be ported and ready for management plant next season thank you all that's all I could present with the interest of your time, Carlos provided a little time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jamil, very much. A wonderful presentation. I always say, I always find remarkable how well you know the, the landscape. I think you say that the um, yeah, I think you always say that it's plus 30 years that you have been at the forefront of the of the efforts of conservation in Sango Bay. Remember that Sango Bay was also a, at some point considered at the, at the highest level as a potential new national park in Uganda. So so it's an interesting it's an interesting landscape to to always look at. And as you were saying it's also an important bird bird how do you say bear, birding area. Um, we have just one one question here in the in the chat. Uh, Jamil, if you're still with us, yes. uh, Hadija would like to to know how can we achieve funding for wetlands conservation, given that generally environmental conservation is underfunded compared to other sectors. And I find that question very interesting. How do we how do we generate revenues and 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 resources for environmental conservation? What are your yes. views on that? Yes, thank you, Hadija and Carlos. But it is all known to us, and even people have been around in the conservation area. It is through partnerships and joint resource mobilization that we can get this happen. Because currently, like what we are saying, Carlos can tell you, it is a consortium of many players that have managed to pull the little resources to see that these things happen. And after the projects, before they close, I make sure I link these activities to other players to call them to support these areas. One thing we must understand that there are many players that can be supportive to us if we remove the bureaucracy. Usually the bureaucracy kills it. Some funders don't want even to touch their funds. So if you tie to bureaucracy that once the funds reach my account, then I will do, that funder goes out. But if you open to conservation only and leave the bureaucracy, somewhere we achieve. Currently with my counterpart in Tanzania, what we do, we share information on a technical and colleague level. We don't use the policy aspect because when we use the policy aspect, it will need a chain of authorities to approve his report to be shared this side. But if he's on ground and calls me, we share and have timely decisions and each side takes action on this we have seen carlos can tell you i i didn't manage to get kaim kaim was a lead uh, uh, tree harvester illegal but now is one of the community movers in conservation because tanzania became hard on him and also it became hard on him this side and he converted and became positive and we are doing wonderful work with him so they really approach to getting resources is working in consortiums and keep on sharing information about the areas we are in. Many people out there can be interested in this. Let me let me uh, come in there, Jamil. I think that uh, we will come back also to the question of uh, Daniel Samson on issues of best practices for, for understanding uh, ecosystem benefits, specifically 
specifically on flood control and water purification. From the angle of this very first question that we got from Harija, which is that one of a understanding and valuating those ecosystem services. I think that's critical also on the on the strategy that the that we have had in Sango Bay. And also that issue that you mentioned of partnerships, because now, even though, for example, IMI was not a was not a player in the in the development of those initial those initial uh, um, uh, management plans and conservation investment programs. Now IMI is now moving also hopefully with uh, with some new ideas also to bring research, but also to join the fundraise for um, hopefully for for getting some some additional funds for continue implementing the existing management plan. Paul, I will give you please the the floor very quickly, and uh, uh, then we will continue with our second uh, our second uh, presenter, Madame Jacqueline. So, Paul, please, if you want to come in. Yes, thank you very much indeed. I want to add my voice to thank Jamil for a very interesting uh, presentation. However, I have got the following comment, uh, and I think Jamil will find time to respond. Now, according to his presentation, there is already a very interesting transboundary cooperation going on. He has shown a lot of cooperation between Tanzania, between Uganda, and very many interesting achievements that he has presented are happening. He has not presented the challenges that require legal solutions. Are we in a hurry to introduce the law, knowing that naturally people don't like laws. People don't want to be coerced. They want to do things at their own time. So are we in a hurry really to bring in the law when things already are happening so well like uh, Jamil has explained? Otherwise, thank you very much indeed. Now, Paul, thank you for, for bringing that aspect in. Um, that was the one very few, the one slide that I didn't want to, to, to bore you with during my presentation. One of my professors in in during my during my PhD, he was convinced that the that the management of cross-border territories through legal instruments required necessarily a, a cooperation mechanism. And that translated to the story of Sango Bay, something that maybe Jamil can, can, can discuss with you bilaterally. But in the management plan, there's also the creation of transboundary wetland committees. So you bring the principles of, a, of those global instruments and also the, a, the, 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 the rules and norms that govern those a, landscapes from a national perspective into the management plan, yes. So that's where, where your, your governing rules and norms are, but also for ensuring that, they, that, that they, those management plans, they are alive and that issues that might require legal discussion or development or understanding new challenges that are coming and, 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 and might have not been considered when the documents were drafted. Then, then you have those wetland management committees that, of course, as you very well know, because I can infer that you are also an expert on these things from your question, institutions, they also have a legal policy component, right? You cannot have an institution if it has not been created somewhere. So I think that's that was our solution for, for that specific problem. I really I really like your, your intervention, so uh, I would really... Um, I would really like to to take it forward bilaterally if that's okay with you, or we can explore a, explore it a little bit later if we have a little bit of time. Paul, just give me a thumbs up if that's okay. Uh, otherwise, I would like to call Madame Jacqueline. Jacqueline, are you with us? Oh, yes, Juan Carlos. Good afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. We have gone a little bit beyond. Um, colleagues, I really commend you to to listen to this presentation because it brings uh, that I am today in the field uh, elements and aspects of sustainability and and value of a, and value chains of, of 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 products that we can grow in the wetland and how communities can actually benefit from it. So, Jackie, I would really like to to give the floor to you right now, and maybe you can start presenting yourself and the, the work that your organization does. And also give me a, give me a shout. Do you need me to move your slides? 
or should I, uh, or you do it yourself? You would do it because I'm using my mobile handset. Okay, I see that you have brought us to the field, so we we are very happy for that. So that it's not a, a, a just a sitting down meeting, but you have brought us to the field. Please, the floor is yours, Jackie. Today are learning on the, on the line of, and then they are doing shoots, bamboo tea, porridge, and wine, and uh, a few of the things. See, that is what they are doing today. These are some of the dryers that they get from the production. And, uh, the harvest from the plantations that they they do. I think you're able to see. Jackie, not very well. Maybe maybe what yeah. we can uh, do is that you that you thank put you. the Let video me... off and we go into the presentation uh, as as we cannot see very well and um and the uh, and the sound is not great. So maybe if you can focus in the presentation now it would be very good. Jackie, are you with us? Okay, so Jackie, you're not with us. Now you are. Thank you. The, pic the picture before you. You. In the a picture of uh, that is a wetland river sewer on the Kenyan side across the bridge. This is uh, how it looks currently after planting. Uh, you're able to share the next slide. Juan Carlos, you're able go to ahead. hear me? Yes, please go yes. ahead. Uh, this is about eco green, and we have been implementing programs on bamboo growing for livelihood improvement and climate change adaptation and mitigation in Kenya. That is uh, the western part of Kenya, and uh, that extends to Uganda. We cover regions in Busia, Bungoma, Siaya, and Vihiga. And currently, we are working with more than 5,000 farmers across the county that is in Kenya and the part of Busia, Uganda are all inclusive and we are at at least 6,000 acres on bamboo that slides within the wetland too. Thank you. Move to the next slide. Now about uh, bamboo and the Green Border Initiative, we say that bamboo is one of the fastest growing yielding renewable resources. And this is the reason why when we are doing the management plan, it came up as a tool that can be used for both conservation and also livelihood, because we realized that one of the reasons that people were depleting the wetland was because of uh, matters pertaining livelihood. And uh, that was an issue that needed an urgent addressing. Therefore, we looked at bamboo and its gain, and then we realized that it has more than 10,000 uses. And this means it could cut across to save on matters related to livelihood. Uh, it was also one of the tools that was at least a quick win for the farmers and could be implemented even when the program was coming to an end. And therefore, we adapted to it. And uh, we started at um, planting uh, 2020, 2021. And today we can see the results. Today we are eating shoots from the planting that we did in 2020 and 2021. We are able to start harvesting of shoots and other products that uh, we'll be able to see in front there. Uh, this and, uh, also involved two parts that was Kenya and Uganda. And because uh, uh, these two different countries shares uh, different laws and policies in Kenya, 
bamboo is a cash crop. That is why we are seeing us eating and using it just like our normal, our, our other normal crops. And it, it does not undergo many of uh, the forest uh, acts and laws. It can be harvested just like can be utilized in any other crop. But unlike in Uganda, and also most of the part of the wetland in Kenya is under people, it's, it's a privately owned, unlike Uganda, where it's communally owned. And this made it easier for the Kenyan side to thrive more than the Ugandan side, because at least the bamboos that we were planting were given to individuals who are able to take care of it and nurture them that just, just like their own crops. And actually, their success, we were able to rate it at 85%. Uh, can move to the next slide. Yeah, now we, we had our farmers being trained on propagation of bamboo seedlings. That was for restoration, beautification, rehabilitation, carbon sink, increase also forest cover and uh, commercial purposes. And uh, since uh, the ending of the program, we are still seeing farmers doing it. We still have nurseries. Currently we have 15 nurseries that are still going on with propagation for bamboos. And uh, they are doing the work and also helping other farmers come in and be able to restore their regions. We were able also to introduce and do site matching for other species because we realized most of the species that were being uh, propagated were from cuttings. And uh, the nature of bamboo is that it always adapts to the age of the mother. And most of the cuttings were dying uh, due to the flowering and any bamboo that flowers will automatically die. So we started introducing some seeds that uh, farmers started adapting to and they are picking also well and uh, we have seen site matching of the same and uh, many regions are adapting to it and they have kept on increasing uh, their production. You can move to the next slide. Uh, now, these are some of uh, the things that we are doing using our bamboo currently in Kenya. We are doing construction using our bamboo. You can see a picture of our fencing, a slab, uh, uh, this construction. We are doing it using bamboo instead of steel, which is a bit expensive. But we realize that the strength of bamboo can still be equated to that of steel if harvested under a good tensile. And uh, we can see this is uh, one of our construction uh, uh, working area that was uh, the, the slab was done using bamboo. And we are also doing electrification poles using bamboo. The trailer you are seeing is harvesting bamboos that are being used as electricity poles as opposed to, to uh, these other trees, timber pole, eucalyptus and concrete because bamboo, now, bamboo poles are a bit lighter and their tensility can always bend and adhere to harsh climatic condition. And also they do not rot like uh, these other trees. Therefore we are kind, currently adapting to the same, the government has also signed in the contract with one of our, our manufacturers that is doing these bamboo poles. And we still encourage more farmers to come in and plant more so that they are able to save on other tree species as they adapt to bamboo. We can see construction. This is our rural houses. Uh, they used to contract, construct using bamboo. And we, we are currently adapting to the same and encouraging the indigenous practices that used to happen. We can move to the next slide. Next slide, okay. So these are bamboo shoots. This is one of the things that we were doing yesterday. These are bamboo shoots that we are able to harvest, dry, and we have trained our farmers on how to make even flour, bamboo flour, to make porridge, to cook ugali, to eat as a delicacy, to use for tea, so that it becomes as how a, a household product that can be utilized at individual levels. We have shown them the nutritious values that are in bamboo and the farmers are adapting to it. Some are picking it as an investment and they are doing it com for commercial purposes. And at least people are able to earn uh, from uh, what we are training them to do. And uh, this has also encouraged more farmers to keep planting 
because now they are able to do it at their very own level. Next slide. These are woven products. We have different lines of production under the bamboo sector. I started by saying that uh, a bamboo has more than 10,000 documented uses, and one of them is under woven products. We are able to weave mats, baskets, and many other things that are handmade, dustbin, lampshade, serving trays, fruit holders, all those can be woven from bamboo. Next. So we see these are handcrafts. Uh, the handcrafts are common things that everybody can make at home level, even without machineries. The phone holders, key holders, cups, disposal plates, cooking sticks, chopsticks, incense sticks, rose combs, earrings, necklaces. These are actually quick wins that women can sit at home and just do them and rush to the market and be able to earn something. And it is workable currently. Youths are joining in and they're able to turn these into useful Next. So the next line of production is charcoal and briquettes. We can see our women drying their briquettes. And now from a charcoal production, bricket making, we are able to get our own biochar from the remains of briquettes, which we still use it on our farms. And it's also another big carbon sinker that we are actually utilizing at farm levels. Many farms have been able to see changes on their farm. Acidity has been reduced and production has increased courtesy of the remains from uh, the bamboo briquettes. And uh, we are seeing actually an increased farm production courtesy of uh, all these. So these are women doing briquettes and these are men uh, mixing biochar with urine from from uh, our dairies, uh, our cows and uh, goats. Yeah. Next slide. So we are seeing the impact to the community. We have seen livelihood improvement, women and youth empowerment, job creation, rest restoration of degraded sites. We had some areas that are. Uh, uh, the, the water aquifers had gone real low, but currently we are able to access even underground water at an upper level because actually uh, the degradation had been reduced. Soil amendment through biochar, we are seeing actually acidity being reduced and actually we see a lot of pro crop production courtesy of the biochar that are being incorporated in planting. Carbon sequestration, we are in talks with companies that are able to pay uh, at least carbon bonuses to our farmers. And we believe that possibly by the beginning of next year, most of our farmers shall start enjoying the benefits that comes with carbon. And also the river bank has been protected. For the last three years, we have not had flooding within this belt. And uh, we have uh, good testimonies that the river has also kept on flowing without dry, dry, drying. So the forest cover in our region has increased according to Kenya Forest Service. I'm yet to get the report from Uganda, but uh, we have able to see that. Uh, next slide. The next slide. So I finish uh, my presentation at that. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Jackie. Yeah, I, thank you, Ancalo. I always love to to hear the enthusiasm and the progress that the that you yeah that you lead on on sustainable production of bamboo in in the COC Teco landscape. There was one specific question that I wanted to that I wanted to pose with you. Are, are you still with me? Yes, I'm here with you. Um, just a clarification from Hadija a, regarding scientific proof that the steel can be stronger, no, that the bamboo can be stronger than steel. Um, I'm not sure that that's the case, but maybe you can somehow reinforce the, 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 the point okay. about how well, strong 
how strong when bamboo we, actually is. When we talk about tensility of bamboo, we are looking at different ages of the same and different species. And uh, when we are comparing bamboo to steel, many a times, uh, where in the case of uh, electrical pole supply that we are doing, we are able to prove that because we, we measure tensility, who is able to pounce back, who is able to break under force, and we realize that steel breaks, bamboo doesn't. When harvested in the correct time, that is when taken under the right tensility, not just every species, not just anything. So when we are talking about tensility, we are looking at species like vulgaris, like aspa, they go with very strong tensile strength and they are able to beat or equate themselves to steel many a times. And that is a yes. Wow, okay, that's, that's very interesting. Now, um, Julius is saying that he's very interested in growing bamboo, but he's very, very far from Busia. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that I'm going to start growing bamboo in Mukono. So maybe, mm -hmm. um, um, Jackie, what you can tell us, it's a little bit of the, the, the soil properties or the altitude properties. What are the ecological conditions needed for growing bamboo? Now we do site matchings and uh, many a times we are looking at the elevation of where the species is to be grown and soil factor. Those are very key elements in any growth of uh, any species of bamboo. So possibly, I don't know if uh, Uganda has been able to do any site matching report that we are able to use. But in Kenya, we were able to carry out last year uh, site matchings and we came out with the uh, species uh, within each and every ecological zone. But I can be able to liaise with one of my colleagues from INBA in Uganda and possibly he can help us in matters related to site matching if any has been done in Uganda, we will be able to guide at that level. Fantastic. Um, colleagues, mm -hmm. if I don't see any more uh, comments in the chat, just one last question from my side. Um, Jackie, if you can expand a little bit on the, um, on the biodiversity and ecological benefits of uh, bamboo in comparison to other species like eucalyptus. I think uh, that point was very interesting, please. Now, when you look at the rooting system of bamboo, it has what we call tendons. Tendons has the capacity to hold your, your ground together. But you know now the rooting system of bamboo doesn't go down deeper. It lies just like any other grass, unlike eucalyptus, which goes deeper but still very weak. For bamboo, it lies in tendons but very strong, just like our common grass. And that is why it's able to fight erosion much stronger than eucalyptus. Now, uh, eucalyptus has a, a, a high level of allelopathy effect in, in its leaves. When the leaves of eucalyptus drop down to your ground, they turn the ground into uh, something which is no more productive. Unlike uh, bamboo leaves, which can be turned into biochar and actually reduce your acidity in the soil. So we realized that the leaves of uh, eucalyptus become poisonous to your soil. The leaves of bamboo become rich to your soil. The rooting system of eucalyptus can only hold a certain level. The rooting system of, of, of bamboo can go much longer that a tsunami cannot uproot it or pull it down. And that is why it's used also for riverbank stability and uh, just to be able to hold the soil together. Now, any other tree, whenever it dominates a place, uh, we, we always say that bamboo is not an agroforestry species, just like eucalyptus isn't, because it's a colonizer. It likes actually good space. But in its lifetime, what we are planting in most of this country, they are clumping species, which are not invasive like the runner types we see in India and China. And therefore, what we have can always be controlled and in its lifetime might never grow beyond five meters. 
So that one cannot be termed as an invasive uh, species. They can always be tamed and be guided on how and when they grow. Like what we are saying, we are even training farmers to use shoots so that in, in the times you feel that uh, it's growing so much, you can turn it into food which is more nutritious, especially to our old people that are developing, with, uh, that, that are starting to have uh, diseases like arthritis, diabetes and ulcers. They can always stand themselves to eating shoots regularly. It helps out on that. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, uh, I think that's, that's, that's as always very interesting. I would uh, commend you if you can, Stay with us, just in case that the um, that there are any other specific questions uh, referred to you. Um, yes. Just a, a a small reflection on this specific case of COC Teco. This was selected as one of 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 the working sites. Uh, because of the long-standing cooperation between Kenya and Uganda. Uh, not only in the platform of EGAT, but also in the platform of the Nile Basin Initiative that we, that yes. we discussed earlier. And uh, also our colleagues from WRI can speak better to it. Also our colleague Ovino from IUCN can also speak much better to it. But uh, um, Uganda and Kenya have, have been working closely together on the um, development of a memorandum of understanding for the management of the CEO Malaba Malakisi system. And the CEO Citeco is just a, that a part of the mouth of the, of the system that ends in Lake Victoria. But the objective was to strengthen the, the, the environmental protection aspect of that broader cooperation of a, yeah, that, that it's being led by government of Uganda and government of Kenya. And that speaks also to the point of, of partnerships and the, uh, all of us pulling together in the same direction, which was a part of the, of the, of the discussion with, uh, with Jamil on how to bring additional uh, financial resources to, uh, to environmental protection. Um, Jackie, do you want to say anything else? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay, now let me just uh, ask uh, our colleague Samson, Daniel, if he wants okay. to come in in relation to his question about benefits of, of wetlands. Daniel, are you still with us? So Daniel was saying, he was asking on a benefits of wetlands in terms of flood control and water purification. And he wanted to inquire a uh, best practices in improving the performance of wetlands. Um, I think it's a very broad, broad question, but uh, of course uh, there's a huge wealth of, of, of scientific research, uh, not only purely uh, wetlands and, and water quality research, but also from, from, from economists from governance specialists that uh, that speak to all of these all of these benefits i think uh, we can share some of those ones from from the ones that i know i think uh, uh, for example the economic valuation of of uh, of wetlands uh, and wetland reduction in what is it in kampala in the kampala landscape for example is very interesting you can also read a lot about what are the, the, the economic losses of a reduced wetlands and reduced wetland a capacities to do things like water purification. Also in terms of flood controls, there's a lot of, of, of wealth on a valuation and coming with specific valuation techniques to, a, to assess how much a, you lose or you 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 gain depending on your conservation strategies and i think that's part of the things that we could uh, yeah that we could do better daniel are you still with us because i see that you wrote in the chat again but um but i cannot hear you do you want to come in 
and make your point. Maybe Daniel has a, an issue with his uh, with his with his microphone. I'm with you. My speaker is faulty. Yeah, but he's following. That's that's what I thought. Yeah. So coming to that point, I think that the um, yeah that that's that's one of the things that it's important. I think there's a there's a lot of 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 a of research. I think we can share some of it. I think that there's a specific sites where. Uh, many of these things, specific, specifically in issues of of a wetland ecosystem services and valuation of those services, I think it's it's something that it's that it's quite well well explored. We can yeah we can we can facilitate some materials on that if that's desired. Um, Hadija, are you are you with us? I'm also very very interested to hear from you if you can come in. Uh, and hear about this this uh, points that you are making on urban wetlands, which I think it's it's an area that is not so well explored uh, as uh, let's say other other more rural landscapes. And I think we need to put a lot of efforts into uh, into yeah into exploring and assessing and understanding better a uh, conservation of wetlands in urban spaces. Adija, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. I didn't have, I don't have a lot to say, except I think I would also encourage that as we are going over all these initiatives to wetlands conservation, then we also need to have proper environmental education uh, because I believe that when we when we conserve for people but we have not involved them uh, maybe teaching them on why they need to conserve what they can do that is why today we are for example if I'm take Uganda's case we are fighting wars of wetlands destruction because people feel that it is the government's initiative to protect the wetlands Sometimes we have seen where destruction goes on in a uh, wetland that is in somebody's backyard, but you'll always hear people say, where is the NEMA? The NEMA is not doing anything. And my question is always, what are you people doing? You have a role to play. So if we can have proper environmental education that runs from maybe our nursery schools, primary schools, so that uh, our young people can know that they have a role to play, they have that environmental citizenship within them, then I think we may possibly find it much easier to conserve our wetlands. Thank you very much, Carlos. I submit. 100% Hadija, I, I, I cannot do anything except uh, agreeing with you. Um, the focus of, of today's uh, uh, session was on, on on transboundary right which is a very specific type of landscape but um but uh, i fully agree with you i think that point on 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 working together and, and and involving all of those that are part and parcel of, of those landscapes in the process of of of, of uh, planning and in the process of managing those resources i think has to be done with with everyone, like they say these days, not leaving anyone anyone behind. Um, one of the things that I really look forward on, on researching and working in the future is on how to bring, um, how to strengthen value chains that are still uh, ecologically viable to local communities, right? Because it's not about just fencing fencing the wetland and protecting the, the, the bird life uh, within the wetland, but it's about also uh, reducing the pressures on that border between, a, let's say, a village and a community and, um, and the wetland itself. So as you develop those, those strategies for conservation, you have to really take into account the needs and the development needs, not only for today, but for 15, 20 years of uh, those communities that uh, that keep on encroaching. I, I'm, I can't hold accountable 
communities that are encroaching on wetlands for 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 subsistence. I can't, even though I'm a lawyer and I know that the law says otherwise. I can't uh, I can't agree with that. I don't think it's fair from a maybe more fully philosophical point of view. Um, something that we really need to think about. I think also as 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 we move forward into exploring areas that that need to be considered uh, thoroughly. It's not only this issue that you were signaling here and thank you very much for thinking of, of of incentives for conservation of wetlands conservation in urban areas but also stakeholder um, stakeholder engagement um colleagues i would like to 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 take if uh, if if anyone wants to to do it i would like to take one last reflection or comment from the from the participants before i before I hand in and submit back to our uh, hosts of the Wetlands, uh, Wetlands Water Resources Institute. Is there anyone that would like to come in and make a, a, a final reflection on different issues that we have heard today? We have heard the aspects of uh, wetland conservation and transboundary water resources. We have issues of transboundary wetlands. We have heard about Ramsar, about conventions, and then we zoomed in into two very specific case studies. Uh, I know that many of you are experts also on these topics, so I'm sure that you have interesting things to share. Um, is there anyone that would like to make a final final reflection before we make the the, the closing remarks? Okay, 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 okay. I will take that uh, that silence as a, as a sign that everything has been clarified and that the, that we are all uh, ready for for our launch. I will just conclude uh, by leaving another of the questions that I have there in my in my to do list of of research open. And I think it has to do with uh, with that issue that was presented by Jamil very, very um, quickly on issues of peatlands. My as we have as we have seen from from previous research, uh, Uganda is a peatlands rich country as well as as South Sudan. Uh, the suit is the suit is one of those peatlands hotspots, as well as Lake Chotera and some of the uh, fringes of Lake Victoria. There's a lot of peatland, which, as you all know, uh, it captures or it contains a lot of um, carbon. It storages a lot of carbon. Now, what I would really like to explore, coming back to that point of uh, incentives for conservation, is whether the UNFCCC, the Secretariat for, for Climate Change, through one of their programs for, uh, I don't know, for example, for, for Red Plus, right, the reduction of emissions through deforestation, could support the government for their uh, efforts to conserve wetlands, not through restoration or, uh, or even a, a, new wetlands, but actually for keeping those wetlands as they are. And I think that's something that it's still not very clear to me, whether whether government of Uganda or government of South Sudan could actually explore some financing mechanism and having real money now put into the communities to ensure that the, yeah, that those wetlands and those peatlands stay um, wet as they are. And with the hope, of course, that the, if there's international funding coming through through those mechanisms to 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 the region, that it also benefits those ones who um, who are there in the landscapes, and not that it, they stay only at the national or the capital level. Um, I think with that, I would like to thank you all for for staying tuned in and for for being part of this uh, this journey that we have been taking. I think we are, uh, as we said, as, as IMI, we are very happy to, to continue discussing with any of you that might have interest in any of these topics or 
on the ones that the my my director Dr. Abdul Karim also presented before more technical issues on solar irrigation and other other things that are uh, at the heart of what IMI does uh, in in East Africa. So with that, uh, Francis and Dr. Dr. Kalist, I think I would like to submit and give back the floor to you. It has been really a pleasure on behalf of, of all my colleagues of, uh, of IMI, but also other colleagues from IUCN, from Oregon State University, from the UNEC Water Convention that have uh, contributed to some of the, um, of, the, of the lessons that we have uh, shared with us today. Special recognition to my colleagues also of GIZ who have sponsored some of the research that was presented today to the Nile Basin Initiative colleagues that are still strong partners of a, a, and strong leaders of cooperation obviously in the region. And um, yeah, of course also to my other two co-speakers Jamil and Jackie, who I believe they are real champions of conservation on transboundary landscapes in, in Uganda and Eastern Africa. With that, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, and yeah, back to you, Dr. Dr. Kalist, for maybe some closing thoughts and maybe some, some news on what's coming up next on the agenda for the, uh, for the webinar series. Thank you very much. Dr. Kalist, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yohan Carlos. Uh, let me, on behalf of the team, thank you and the rest of the team for the very, very good sharing. Let's give you an applause. I know you may not see all of us, but we, we do appreciate. Yes, I see Paul, we might already clapping. Where I am, I can't put on my, my camera, but I am clapping as well as you could have heard. I think the sharing has clearly highlighted the important role of international water law in fostering transboundary cooperation and environmental protection. And I think the three presentations have put it right. I think what you have highlighted, Juan Carlos, is really the importance of ensuring that we have frameworks that enable us to work together across borders. And as you rightly say, I would like to inform uh, uh, the people on, on, on the webinar, that Uganda is in advanced stages to accede to the UN water uh, conventions. So uh, we advance, we'll be submitting our request to cabinet prior by the end of uh, November. And very soon Uganda will have, uh, will have acceded to the global water conventions. But we already are part to the Nile Base Initiative. That's why you host the Nile Base Initiative in Uganda. Uganda has signed the Nile Basin Cooperative Framework Agreement. We are part to Lake Victoria Basin Commission and also East Africa Community. We are part to Intergovernmental Authority on Development. We are part of the global processes. So Uganda is really very much uh, actively participating. And of course, we are part of the Ramza Convention. So whatever I've talked about, Uganda has embraced. And I do hope that those who have listened in appreciate why Uganda should be part of these international uh, agreements. Uh, in uh, the uh, presentation, of course, uh, we started with uh, Dr. Abdul Karim, highlighting the work that he is doing, very, very interesting. And I think it's through a challenge to all of us. Let's identify areas where Uganda, with the different stakeholder groups, we can work with the IMI. And right now we are in the final stages we are finalizing a memorandum of understanding to work with the IMI in Uganda. We have submitted our MOU to Minister of Justice for clearance, and we expect that within a short time we'll have an agreement that formalizes our relationship with the IMI. And personally, I've seen a number of areas which we are going to collaborate in, and the, the, the MOU gives that broad framework, and it is basically positioning the Minister of Water and Environment take advantage of the capacity and resources available to me. And I want to encourage all of you online to take advantage of that. Let us know the areas you are interested in, the MOU will be, will, will, will be broader. Uh, I see on the call, we have a number of people, of course, they didn't come in, but I see Aaron Nicole, 
I hope you are still there. Nice seeing you. Of course, I see John Wino. These are the people that you have been working with in the basin. So I do hope that you appreciate the efforts you have put in and how these efforts can actually get us to move to where we, uh, we are. We are still very far. We still have a lot of work to do. And that's why sharing like this, in my view, becomes very important. And that's the reason why the Water Resources Institute through the Minnesota of Water and Environment has instituted these monthly webinars so that we can use it as an opportunity to share and get to know what is being done. And indeed, what has been shared, very, very impressive. Next month, at the end of November, we'll also be having another webinar. And this time, we are going to be looking at issues of rural water supply, issues of pipe corrosion and all that. So we'll be having Dr. Kastin Dunnett, who from Ask for Water, she has been working with the Rural Water Supply Network. She will be sharing with us the work she has done in Uganda and other areas on how we can improve rural water supply and how we can ensure that you avoid these challenges of corrosion. So every month we want to get different perspectives. This time we have talked about international water law. Next month we'll go to rural water. Uh, the, the following months we'll be going into other areas. And I want to request so those who would want to share, please, the work you are doing is very, very important and we want people to know about it. So I see colleagues here. I want to challenge all of you. Let's share the work. Whether you are in the private sector, you are in academia, civil society, government, the work you are doing needs to be known. And I think this is an opportunity. We, we are also trying to take advantage of this also to move the agenda on climate change. Uganda is preparing for COP. And we'll be having a pavilion. We are now working to make sure that we have a number of activities shared during COP. And those who may be interested in being part of, of, of Uganda Pavilion in COP, they let us know. Again, these are areas where we can work together. We want to call upon our partners to come and join. I chair the, the committee that is preparing the program for COP. So if any of you is interested in sharing, let us know. Again, this going to COP, but also the sharing even when we have not gone. So. On behalf of the Water Resources Institute, I really want to thank Imi, Dr. Ioni Carlos, and your team. I think you have uh, really done a good job. I want to thank Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn should be online, coordinator of the Water Resources Institute, with Francis and the rest of the team. I want us to give them an applause. They are doing a fantastic job. So Gwendolyn, Francis, and your team at the Water Resources Institute, thank you very much for making all these things happen. We do appreciate Keep going. Colleagues, we are stronger together. With those, I want to wish you a nice day. Thank you for sparing time to join us. Until we meet next month. Thank you. And now we close the webinar. You can now go for lunch. I think it is lunch hour. So if you find somewhere, take lunch, you go for lunch. Where I am, it is in the morning, so I won't go for lunch. I'm going for breakfast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, bye.